So I'd like to bring up our panelists, the screenwriter, Tom Shulman. <laughs> I was mentioning that he actually wrote a, another very successful movie in 1989, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Very different. And, uh, he wrote the, uh, uh, also the movie What About Bob, very funny movie. He wrote and directed Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag and the very recent movie Double Down South, which you should check out. Um, that's, it's a very good film that Thank came you. out earlier. No, I, is Stephen Half the producer here? Uh, I don't see him. Maybe he left. Okay. No, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he never came. Him. But okay, so we um, we also have the great co-star of the movie, Kirkwood Smith. He has many credits, many other films, including uh, Broken Arrow, uh, A Robocop, To Die For, Citizen Ruth, Girl Interrupted, Deep Impact, probably best known for his role on the long-running smash hit TV series, That 70s Show, and Woo! current reincarnation, That 90s Show. <laughs> so. Well, let me ask, start with Tom, I guess. Um, how did the story, uh, was it inspired by your own history and to what degree? Uh, somewhat. I went to a, a, a private boys' school, uh, a day school, not an overnight school. Uh -huh. And uh, sophomore year, there was a teacher, Sam Tickering, our English teacher, who was antic, young, antic, uh, great teacher and uh, just never knew what he was going to do. And uh, oh. years later, I was at a place called the Actors and Directors Lab, and the, one of the teachers there was a gentleman named Harold Clerman, who had come in oh. from New York uh, here to LA and just probably one of the best speakers I've ever heard. He, he could go on for three or four hours and he wanted three or four more. And I started writing a story about him, really, but then the students were all actors, and it just it, it didn't seem to go anywhere. So I, it, by that time, I was hooked on writing something about a teacher. So I reached back to, to that high school experience. Right, and was it um, like an easy movie to get made, or did it take a, oh, a it was, long time? It, oh my God! It was <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I finished the script, I, I gave it to my agent, and uh, he called me at two o'clock in the morning, woke me up saying it's the best script I've ever read, come see me in my office first thing tomorrow. So I went in there and he looked uh, at me and he said, you know, this, uh, I, I stand by what I said last night, but I can't sell it. It's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's all boys. There are almost no girls, no sex, no violence. Um, you know, it could be a, a, a sort of calling card script for you, but <laughs> it's never gonna get made. And if you want to try to get it made, you're going to have to get another agent. So <laughs> I left him. It was turned down by five or six agents. One took it. He told me he read half of it and thought maybe some of the actors at his agency could would, would uh, do it. Maybe he could get it made. I lived in fear he'd read the other half of the script and fire me as a client. Uh, maybe two years later, Stephen Haft, who's not here tonight, who had read the script uh, two years before that, called my agent and said, I can't get this thing out of my head. I want to try to get it made. I know Jeffrey Katzenberg from high school, and uh, mm. Jeffrey was president of Disney at the time, and Disney had already passed. Uh, and a director at Disney who was trying to get a, an ensemble musical made read the script, and he said, I don't want to do that musical. I want to direct this. So those two gave it to Katzenberg. Katzenberg bought it. And right. that sort of set it on its trajectory, although the first production we shot one day and they canceled the movie and burned the sets. So <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't for maybe another year and a half before they made the film. So, and so did uh, Peter Weir's involvement uh, push it past the finish line, yeah, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it was, I think it was past the finish line with three directors, but it, huh. in, in each case it stumbled. I guess they fell under the, the, the tape. And uh, yeah, so Peter, as soon as Peter came on board, 
Robin, who had said yes, would not say no to the first director, but wouldn't say yes, uh, then came on board and, and you know, eight months later we were making the movie. Right. So, so let me ask um, Kerwood Smith, working with Peter Weir as a director, what do you think uh, he contributed? What do you think his strengths were? There's another microphone. Is this, is this working? Turn it back. No. Oh, it's got a button. <laughs> Yes. Um, first, I should say, just in, in, in terms of what Tom was saying, uh, it, when the script first came to me, uh, it, it was with Robin, and I said, oh yeah, I'll do this, uh, this, this is great. And then they, they called back some time later and said, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, uh, it's now with a, a director who shall not be named, and uh, <laughs> Robin is no longer a part of it. Oh. And I said, uh, really, let me see, the, and, and they said there have been some changes in the script, so the changes that I saw in the script were deadly. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so I think Keating ended up with leukemia and uh, was in the hospital and all kinds of things. So I said, no, 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 I, you know, and then they call back yet again and said, Peter Weir's going to direct it and Robin's in. And so I was very excited to do it. Right. I think working with Peter, he's one of the best directors that uh, I've ever worked with still. Um, he had uh, a great feeling for the script and for each of the characters. He's, he's a director who cares very much about every performance. He watches you like a hawk. Um, not only to see that you get it right, but to see what you might also be bringing to the role. Um, and uh, I'll give you an example. Um, the scene early in the film when I, uh, 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 it's the first day of school, and I come into his room and say, uh, you're not going to be on the school paper this year, et cetera. <clears throat> um, we shot that one day, and we shot my stuff, but we didn't have enough time to shoot Bob's. So we were gonna do that the next morning. That night we watched some dailies, and I think it was maybe the scene um, I don't think it was the I don't think it was the big argument scene after the play. I think it was when he first hears about the play, that little scene in the office. Oh. And I was very disappointed in what I had done that day because it was the same sort of stuff, you know, where the dad, the father was just on him and embarrassing in front of his friends and everything. And I thought, well, that's not, that's wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I should have tried to be nicer about it, tried to deal with him, take him out in the hallway, lean on him a little bit, make some jokes about it. That's the way it should have been done. And um, so the next day when I went back, we were shooting Bob Either I was off camera or it was over my shoulder, I don't remember. And I started doing it the way I thought it should be done. And Peter stopped and said, you know, you're doing this differently than you did yesterday, which is a kind of a no-no, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, and I said, yes. And he said, is it because of what you saw in the dailies last night? And I said, <laughs> I said, yes, it is. And he said, you're right. He said Johnny to the uh, DP. He said, "Turn it around. We're gonna re we're gonna reshoot Kurtwood stuff." And so that's that's a real no no because you're because you're taking up time. Um, that can be as much as a half a day's worth of shooting. And if you've already done it, then to redo it, you've really you're really going out on the line. But he did it because it was right it made the scene better it made the movie better 
And that's the way he was throughout the whole film. You always knew he was watching how you put your shoes. If you didn't put your slippers the way you had done it last time when he liked it, he would make you redo it. <laughs> you know, um, I, uh, the scenes when we were sleeping, uh, when I was asleep, um, and Neil is in the office. Again, we had been working the night before, so I was tired. So, you know, we shot all the stuff we needed to, and he said, okay, I just want to get some, I want to get some outtakes of you sleeping. And that's so that um, um, if they're, when they're cutting the movie together, if they want, if they're cutting him in the office and they wanted to come back to me asleep, you know, they've got that. Uh, so I said, okay, great. So I lay down and I fell asleep. I just <laughs> fell sound asleep. And the next thing I heard was, cut. All right, Kerwin, no, this time. And I thought, he wants me to be asleep. I am actually asleep <laughs> and it's not good enough for him. <laughs> but that's the way Peter was. He, 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 he cared so much about every moment in the script. And um, I consider it uh, a great uh, piece of good fortune to have been in this film. You know, you're not the only um, actor. I, I've talked to some other actors that also said that Peter Weir was the best director that they had ever worked with. And um, from your point of view uh, uh, as a writer, I mean, I, I, well, first, I mean, did you, were you on the set? Uh, were you, did you participate in the making of the film? Yeah. And, and what were your impressions of Peter Weir's gifts as a director? Uh, exactly the same as Kurt Ruthie. I, yeah, I was there. I, I, I missed a few days, maybe a week and a half. I had to go back to LA and work on What About Bob, I think. But, uh, uh, but, and I remember when I came back, they were shooting some of the scenes from Midsummer Night's Dream, and I said, where's Peter? And they said, he's in the third, uh, in the third row. And I looked, I said, there's nobody in the third <laughs> row. And they said, he's there. And I looked, and he was asleep on the floor. And, and I walked in, and he, I, I, I was looking at him, and he, I must have sensed I was there, or I was in the light, and he looked at, oh, Tom, you're back. Uh, I'm glad you're back. He said they sent the script to a professional typing place. And by this time, we're three quarters of the way through shooting the movie. He said, and it, it's not the 129 pages you said it was, which I knew already. It, it's 145 pages. It's 25 pages too long. You're going to have to cut 25 pages uh. out. I said, Peter, there are only 30 pages left to shoot. He goes, I know it's a problem. But I, I said, we can't take any more. He said, oh, forget it. We'll just tell him, forget it. I said, okay. And he laid down and went back to sleep. But he, he was as collab, you know, I, I, I had seen Witness the night I finished one of the drafts of the script. And I wow. just, I told my wife, this is the director for this movie. And I, I got it sent to him and his agent, or he passed and that was that. And for two or three years later, to have him directing the movie was just an incredible, you know, I was right. out of my mind excited about it. And uh, Peter was, we talked about everything. He showed me all the casting tapes. We would take, take duplicate copies home at night and then meet the next day and say, we, we always like the same person for, for each role. So it was, it was an amazing right. experience. Maybe because you, each share a, a little bit of you know, thoughts or reminiscences of Robin Williams. And we know, I mean, he was known for not always sticking to the script and, uh, you know, improvising and doing wild things. Uh, how did he behave in this case? Um, well, I, I, uh, I, uh, I knew Robin from before I had done uh, we were both from the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, oh. and I worked. Uh, I spent a summer uh, doing plays with Robin, oh. um, so I knew him from before. And actually, didn't have much to do with him in the film. I, I right. saw him a couple times, but um, uh, he he was such a such a talented person, and 
it's difficult to watch this film now without that sort of hanging over the yeah. film. Um, and uh, considering that the film deals with a major suicide. Um, right. But Robin was such a treat to work with. He could drive you crazy, especially if he was behind you. Um, <laughs> there was a play that we were doing and uh, I had a big, I, I was the father and he was this oddball uh, uh, character that my daughter was hanging around with. And um, so we have this big scene and I'd be sitting in my chair, you know, holding forth about this and that and then the audience would be laughing. And I'd turn around and Robin would just be sitting there like, no. And he would never tell me what he was doing. <laughs> but every night he, uh, he was doing, he was up to some sort of, some sort of shenanigans. He was, Robin was a wonderful guy, especially if there were only two or three of you. Um, if it got to about five people, Robin suddenly went on and, um, and he could keep you laughing for a long time. But he used that, I think, to hide behind a lot. He, uh, if you sat down and talked to him by yourself, he was much like he is in this, you know, sweet, charming. Um, but there was that part that he couldn't control when he felt he had an audience. Um, but I think Peter, uh, I don't know, maybe you were there when this was going on. Peter said that he had, uh, he had worked with the boys and, and um, um, Robin quite a bit. They had done sort of takeoffs on the scene just to get it out of their system. So Robin could screw around as much as he wanted and the boys could have all the laughs that they wanted so that then when they came back to working on the scenes, they could be a bit more serious about them, which I thought was a rather clever way of doing it. And I wish I had been there when that was going on. <laughs> yeah, I, I was there for that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, Kurt, with the Robin, you know, in, in a group, if you're with him alone or two or three people, he was just you know, normal and, and but put four or five people there and, he was, and then he was entertaining. Right. and entertaining compulsively. Yeah. So every time a scene was over and you know Peter would call cut, Robin would launch into something and you know start entertaining the crew for right. 5, 10, 15 right. minutes. It was so funny, you didn't want it to stop, but, and Peter didn't want it to stop either, but finally he said, look, we gotta get some work done. <laughs> Robin, shut up, leave the set, come back and, and do it again. Ironically, well, the first day that Robin was there, we shot some of the soccer stuff. And Robin was so on book, had memorized the script, and was said that it it was it was it was dead. And I, I was watching and just mortified. What's going on? And Peter was too. And we shot for a day, about half a day. And Peter said, you know, at the end of right after lunch, Robin's going to entertain some of the students at the school because that's part of the deal for for getting to use the school. So he went off with a a big megaphone and, and all the kids were in the bleachers and he spent an hour and a half entertaining them, you know, improvisationally and then he left. He came back, he was coming back two weeks later to, to really start the movie because he was in a play in New York. And I said to Peter, what, you know, he was, what are we gonna do? And he said, I, I don't know, we got two weeks to figure it out. So when Robin came back, Peter designed this imp improvisation where Robin would come into the classroom. He, he did the shakes to the Macbeth thing. The, he did, it's in there in the movie, read to the kids. And as soon as he did that, Robin realized that teaching was very similar to stand-up, that it's not, he's not up there delivering a monologue, that even if the kids aren't talking back, it's a dialogue. He's looking for reactions. Right. He's poking at this person and that. And from that moment on, he, he completely got it. He made it his added lines, whatever, and it was great. So that, and, and but he got funnier between scenes too. So it was just about, that slowed us down, I think a couple of days, but a great couple of days. Yeah. And, uh, how about the, the casting of the boys? Of course, a couple of them 
gone on to do great things in years afterwards. But, uh, you know, it's an ensemble yeah. piece, and um, how did they all work together? They were, they were all put on the same floor of, of their hotel room. They were basically the same age. And uh, I was unfortunately put on their floor too. Like I remember <laughs> maybe the second night, they, right before we were shooting, I heard this loud crash about three in the morning and I came out of my room, you know, in my underwear basically. And they're in the hall, they've got about 12 liquor bottles empty <laughs> on the floor and they're rolling a baseball down the hall and you know, like they were bowling and smashing these bottles, glass was flying. And you know, I was trying to stop them, and they were just laughing at me. <laughs> and it was just, you know, but they bonded that way, and and it, I think it shows in the movie. Yes, right, right. So, was there any um, concern about the ending? Um, you know, now I don't know if people um, would <laughs> approve an ending like that for a major studio movie, at least maybe for a small independent movie. But I, I mean. Was there, I mean, it, in a way, it, it's upbeat, but, you know, there's a suicide and there's right. a tragedy here. Uh, I remember when we discussed the suicide, you know, Peter Weir said to me that he had had the privilege of talking to Ingmar Bergman, the great director, yeah. and Bergman had said to Peter, apropos of, not apropos of this movie, he said, the only mistake you can make in a movie is have the main character commit suicide. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> and I said, Peter, well, what are we going to do? And he said, we're going to hope he's wrong. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, the studio never gave us a note about it. I mean, I, I don't know. It, right. uh, and in, in line with that, you know, Kurt, you're playing a sort of a, a, a pretty unsympathetic character here. Um, even though he clearly uh, uh, loves his son, but has all the wrong ideas about what his son should do. I mean, does that concern you? I mean, some actors oh, they don't like to play unsympathetic characters. What's your thought about that? Or is it just the part of acting? Um, yeah, it didn't concern me that he, um that he was unsympathetic. Uh, I, as you said, uh, I, I, I felt very much that it, and actually the father in um, um, the 70s shows is somewhat the same huh. in that, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not in terms of being unsympathetic, but uh, <laughs> that, that, that he, he's raising his son for the world that he lives in, right. not for the world that the boy is growing up in. Um, and it's, uh, so it is a fault. But they were very insistent, uh, Disney in particular, Katzenberg was very insistent that, uh, that the father uh, be, um, for lack of a better word, the villain. Um, so that when I started talking about, well, you know, I, th I think maybe he should try this and that, Peter got a little bit nervous and said, yeah, but he's got to remain the heavy. And I said, okay, fine, fine. So it was a question of finding the right line. We made him too sympathetic, right. then the movie made less sense. Um, so, yeah. So it was, it was a tricky deal, but that, you know, uh, and when, when you're in that kind of situation, you want a director like Peter Weir. Right, right. So, Tom, I mean, did that come out of your personal experience at all? I mean, I know a lot of people, I mean, I had a, a very uh, um, a critical father also, not quite as extreme as the father here, but had a lot of ideas of what I should do. I don't know if that was part of your growing up also, yeah, but I think a lot of people probably have yeah, lived yeah. through that. I mean, I, I grew up in an era where most of our parents had been through the Depression as, as young boys, young men, and you know, that 
that era demanded a, a, a certain, you know, strictness and, and, and focus and in some sense, lack of humor, you know, right. just, so uh, one of my closest friends, father was very, almost exactly like this character. And uh, my friend didn't kill himself, but he, uh, this father restricted my friend in ways that, that I always found tragic because he had a lot of potential in, in various areas that his father said, you're not doing that. And right. he quit right. all those things, right. so, right. yeah. yeah. Um, any, um, just under a few questions, any questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, you talked about how uh, it went through several iterations before it was finally made. Uh, after it was made and the studio executives saw it, did they say, yes, you were right? Or did they say, well, I don't know. How, what, what was their reaction? Um, you know, the, the, the executives that bought it didn't really have any sense that, that there had been a struggle to get it made or that their own studio had passed on it. You know, they just didn't make those kind of connections. Even if they knew it, they wouldn't admit it. So uh, I think a junior executive had passed. Katzenberg had never heard about it or read it. That executive left the studio before the, the script was purchased there. So, you know, they were, they were once they decided, once Jeff Katzenberg read it, studio was kind of all in. Although the, I, I think I sold it on a Monday night and, on, and I was very nervous because I had no idea what the studio's take on the movie was, uh, on the script. And my agent said, well, you'll, you'll find out in the next couple of days. And I think on a Wednesday, I got a 40-page sheaf of notes, oh. basically, that started with, while well, we love this story, it, it's an ensemble, it shouldn't be, it should be only about the, t the, the teacher character. Let's start when he was in high school. Let's oh. watch him go through college, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I just, you know, <laughs> sweat poured off of me. And they said, well, you've got a meeting with Katzenberg on Friday, so, you know, prepare to make your case. And I, you know, I terrified and thought this is, is gonna be ruined. So I went to Katzenberg's office there were a group of executives sitting over in, in his little living room area. I sat down and started <laughs> chatting with them, and Katzenberg was over at his desk reading something. And finally, he turned and said, who did the notes, guys? And the executives sort of pointed at each other and said, well, it was teamwork, and you know, we really didn't have time to polish them, but you know, it's, it's a start. And he said, you're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, don't you think? And he, threw them over his shoulder, walked over, and said, let's make the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that doesn't happen at all, but it happened that time. So, yes. yeah. I just want to say thank you for making the movie. I was a high school teacher in 1989, and it affected my, my own teaching, it affected my students, and it affected me personally, too. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. Oh, nice. Yes, to go ahead in the back. Again, first of all, thanks again for being here, playing the song, and thanks again for uh, for everything that you guys have done in your careers. As I sit here and, and listen to this tonight, um, a couple movies I think of, and I'm just curious. First of all, I wonder if Affleck and Damon were influenced by this movie when they wrote Good Will Hunting, because I see a lot of parallels of having that mentorship relationship. I know it's easy to make the parallels if you have Bob and Damon as a quote, but you've got the mentorship. I think the other comment that I have for you, Tom, is there was a movie made just a couple years later, uh, School Time, which of course has a lot of similar themes, uh, you know, prep school, but it's not as good of a film, I think largely just because of the importance of relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, the relationships that you built in this movie um, were something else. And then, Perwood, to you, my comment is, I'm just fascinated. You, know, you have a lot of roles that you've played, this movie is one of them, A Time to Kill, where you, you almost a villain, right? And then you look at The 70s Show, and you're a grouch there, but to be able to turn that switch, right, from the, you, there, there's a level of meanness in all those characters, but to go from comedic to truly being villainous is, is truly uh, special. So thank you for that. Thank you. I heard a rumor, I think just a few weeks ago, that, that uh, either Damon or Affleck were next to come in to, 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 for one of the parts, the, the main parts of the movie. I think uh, Bobby Leonard's part, uh, Neil. And then the, the day they were supposed to come in, they got word that we had cast that part. Huh. So, uh, you know, whether it had any influence on them or not, I don't know. But it could be. Right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I may have missed at the beginning. 
how did you come up with the original idea of the script? Yeah, you, you missed it at the beginning. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to bore everybody with it again. He lived through it. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask, um, going to the, the end of the story, I suppose, in a way, what was it like for you to um, uh, go to the Oscars and win the Oscar that, that night? I mean, I don't know if you anticipated that might happen. Or... Well, you're one of five. It, it could right. happen. So, uh, <laughs> and they have a, a, a luncheon about four or five days before the the ceremony and they basically force you to write your speech. They want you to write something, huh. you know, 30 seconds long so they don't have to play you off and all that. So, you know, you do that and, you know, you. but I, I guess of all the characters in the movie closest to me, it would be Todd, the Ethan Hawke character with, at the time, tremendous fear of public speaking. Right, right. So honestly, while I was sitting there and there, the whole two or three hour run up to the award, I just thinking, Please don't let it be me. Like, I don't want to have to get up there in front of the you know hundred millions or whatever and do that. But then it was me. So uh, and I it was just a blank. But Jane Fonda was my my presenter, right. and um, you know I I think I forgot to thank a couple people. And as we were we she took me off and we were, got on an elevator and she said you look so unhappy. We did, you just won an Oscar. What's wrong? And I said, I, I forgot to thank this person and that. And she goes, well, you'll thank them next time. <laughs> so we, we got in the elevator and we go down into the bowels of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion and there's a, you walk out onto a little stage, they have these giant plastic Oscars, and in front of me were bleachers with about 40 uh, members of the Hollywood press, hurling, she introduced me, hurling questions at her. Jane, what's like you? Know, we what's like life like with uh, Ted? Ted, uh, what's who she with? Uh, yeah, Turner. Ted, Ted Turner. Turner. Yeah, right. what, what's your next movie? About? She goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, please. This is all about Tom. This is not about me. Please address your questions to Tom. And pause. Somebody says, Tom, what's it like to get an Oscar from Jane? <laughs> so Jane said, that's it. We walked off. I took my statue. I walked back to my seat. And I realized, you know, where, where the hierarchy is right. in Hollywood. It hadn't changed because I'd won an Oscar, so. <laughs> Tom, I, I, I have a question for you. Um, have you had people thank you for writing the script because they got their father or their friend's father or to see the movie and that it changed their life? Many people. It's been, without a doubt, the most rewarding Isn't that thing. the yeah, best, it is. right? It's, That's... Yeah, it's, it's a humbling and wonderful yeah. experience. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just, um, yeah, go ahead. question is if you had an encounter with anyone from the public who's seen the film giving you a, you know, a compliment or some sort of feedback about your role in the movie that's moved you. Yeah, I, I, I've had people, uh, the, the question I just asked Tom, I, because I was sure that he had had that happen, I've had it happen a number of times that people have said this movie changed for some reason, it's always my friend's life. It's usually, it's not their own. Uh, but uh, you know, I in fact I received a letter last week from uh, from from someone who said that that film uh, changed their life because their father was very much like that, and that this person had gotten him to go and see this film, and it really had changed. 
you know, and that's really the best compliment that you can get. I, if you if you can feel that you have done something to change people's lives, not just in terms of entertaining them, but something that actually moves them, that that's that's a great feeling, and it's it's always a it's an ensemble situation. Tom wrote it and. I played the part, and you know Bob is the one who who made us all uh, cry about it. So it's just it, it's things like that that make you feel like you're in a good business. Mm -hmm. Now you. Just, uh, just to add to that, I mean, I've had so many people come up to me saying, you know, I was in high school when I saw this. I was going to do X, and this because of this movie, I decided I wanted to be a teacher. And that just, you know, thrilled me. And, and you know, I hope I didn't somehow ruin their lives with that. But it's, it's you know, such a compliment that, that people would, the movie would affect them in, in what I think of in such a positive way. Right. And, and, and were you surprised, the point that I made at the beginning, that, you know, besides how well done the movie is and all the acclaim that it had, that it was such a box office success and, uh, I mean, did you anticipate that? I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, Disney opened it opposite Batman. Right. And, you know, I thought they were burying the movie. It didn't seem like a, a summer movie. Batman came out, I think, in the first or second week of June in the summer of 89. And uh, I remember when I heard that they were going to release it opposite Batman, I stormed into Katzenberg's <laughs> office. And he wasn't there, but I knew his assistant pretty well. And she said, my God, you look really upset. And I said, I am upset. And I told her why. And she said, well, he's in that room over there. It's a board meeting. Go on in and tell him. <laughs> and I said, Cynthia, I'm not going into a board meeting. She said, yes, you are. Just go in there. I said, he's going to throw me out of the studio. She said, it'll be fine. And if, if you want it changed, you better get in there. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I walk. I opened a door. And all these people just turned and looked. And Jeffrey was down at the end of the table. He goes, what are you doing here? And I said, I, I, I'm upset and Cynthia convinced me to come in here. And he goes, well, what are you upset about? I said, you're burying Dead Poets Society. And he goes, I'm glad you asked this question. Sit down, I want to explain this. And he explained the Disney, their, their philosophy that was whenever any, everybody was going left, they went right. And in the middle of the summer when everybody was watching all the big popcorn movies, Disney would have a movie out there that, that would uh, satisfy some of the older people or whatever who wanted something more serious, and it was going to be just fine. So I didn't believe it, but that was what, what they did, and it worked. Yeah. Well, I, I found, uh, you know, I was very moved by the film when it first came out, and I was very moved by it again tonight, so it, it still works. Okay. Thank you both, Coco. Uh, Thank you all. Thank you.